and I'm very, very happy to bring it here. Um, so I study public understanding of science and climate change communication. And what you all are about to get is the entire climate change communication course that I teach at Eckerd College in 45 minutes uh, for free. So lucky you. Um, this is obviously the simplified version. Uh, you don't have to read all the papers my students do. Um, but this is what I've been working really hard on. This is, this is my passion. So I don't know about for you, but for me, climate change is often the big elephant in the room um, that nobody's talking about. And this is something that is, I've decided to make my mission to change. Uh, I think it's really important that we are, are talking about climate change more. Um, and so before I give you more information about the best ways to talk about climate change, I also want to show you some examples of people who are doing it very, very well. Um, so to start off with, I have Catherine Hayhoe. Um, Catherine Hayhoe is a climate scientist, but she's also an evangelical Christian. And so what's really great about Catherine Hayhoe is that she is able to bridge the science and religion divide in a way that most other climate communicators have not been able to do. And she's amazing at it. Um, so I highly recommend uh, looking at her work. She is, um, she teaches and researches in Lubbock, Texas, um, and she's incredible. The other um, group that I would like to bring your attention to is the Yale Program on Climate Change Communication. And I will actually have several of their maps and their data in this presentation. Um, it is a group of psychologists and social scientists at Yale and George Mason who are working together to look at best practices for climate communication. And they have on their website numerous guides and materials for communicating about climate change. And they also have publicly available data on uh, public polling about climate change opinion and climate change understanding. So they have some really interesting stuff on there. So if you're looking for more information, these are two people to, or one person and one group to look up. So when it comes to the environment, um, it generally falls very low on people's concerns, lists of concerns, things that they're worried about. Um, and they, although most people will call themselves environmentalists and say they care about the environment, when they have to rank the environment against other things, they usually rank it pretty low. So this is um, percentage of people in 2018 in both January and February who mentioned uh, that climate change is, or env the environment is, is a problem that the country is facing right now. And you see we have 2 and 3% of people polled. And this is from Gallup. Um, and in fact, when you just ask people about the environment, climate change is actually usually at the bottom or very close to the bottom of their environmental concerns as well. Um, people generally are more concerned about uh, pollution in water and general air pollution, for instance, than they are about global warming or climate change. Um, now, most, some of the most recent data shows a slight change in that. Um, this is, uh, the last ones were 2014, 2015, 2016. This shows you through 2017, climate change has moved up a, a slight amount um, above uh, loss of rainforest and, and animal extinction, planted animal extinction. But it's still really low on people's lists of priorities. So the question is, how do we change this? Um, so in order to do that, we have to understand why. We have to understand what do people know about climate change and global warming. Um, why is there denial in the United States about the existence of climate change and its anthropogenic causes? And why has it become so political in the United States? Um, and so we're going to dive into these things. Um, so first, let's talk about public understanding. Um, so like I said, I study public understanding of science. And you might imagine that that's kind of a frustrating thing to study, um, and it can be. Uh, and public understanding of climate change can be even more frustrating. Um, people's understanding is not very high in the general public. So when it comes to the science, one thing that's really interesting is that people tend to confuse climate change and other environmental issues. Um, and the one that happens the most frequently is confusing climate change with the hole in the ozone layer, uh, or in global warming with the hole in the ozone layer. They're both atmospheric things, and people just seem to mix them up in their head, even though, and I have this with my students, my current undergraduate students, even though um, CFCs were banned in aerosol cans before they were born, 
um, in the United States, they still confuse the whole layer with, with global warming, which is very interesting. Um, I did a pre-survey in my climate change communication class this semester, and I also had students say that um, trash in the ocean causes global warming. So there is a lot of confusion out there. Also, um, and you probably have seen this with uh, politicians recently, uh, people tend to confuse climate and weather. Um, and I actually have a good metaphor that I like to use for people to help them understand the difference between climate and weather. I say climate is how you decide where you're going to go on vacation. Weather is how you decide what you're going to pack. So climate, you pick a place that has a great climate, and then before you go, you check the weather because it might be raining the whole time. Climate is about long-term trends in an area, and weather is a day-to-day -day thing and harder to predict. Another thing that people tend to not understand about climate change and global warming is the scientific consensus. Uh, and I'm actually doing a study right now just to see if members of the public know what a scientific consensus is or have any ideas about what a consensus is. But the public generally tends to underestimate um, how much of the relevant scientific community believes climate change is anthropogenic. So one of the things that there's a group called the Consensus Project is attempting to do is help close that gap. So the public generally believes that about 45% of climate scientists think that climate change is anthropogenic, when the real numbers are somewhere between 90 and 100% of climate scientists. So just that misconception alone is huge. It's another part of um, the, the issues with, with public understanding of the science of climate change and the science of science. But. Um, Another important thing is the urgency of climate change and the consequences. Um, people tend to believe that climate change is something that's going to happen very, very far away, um, and that it probably will happen far into the future, and that it probably won't happen to them. Which is one of the reasons why I absolutely hate the polar bear as the symbol of climate change. Um, because polar bears are not people, they live very far away, and yes, they can be cute, but at the end of the day, people really don't care about polar bears that much, not as much as they do about you know, having their car or, or living their normal daily lives. Um, so polar bears tend to make people think of climate change as actually not that big a deal. Um, and then finally, if you don't understand all of these other things, then it can be really difficult to understand what you can do about climate change. And there's sort of two main camps that people fall into, either believing that the problem is just absolutely too big and there's nothing that they can possibly do about it or they can't possibly be effective by themselves or the opposite end saying I recycled today therefore I have done my part on climate change I'm golden go on with my life um, but this is called by the way single action bias um, where you think that you've done the one thing like recycling and now you're good to go you are a, a, an environmental god now um, so this is another common misunderstanding. So this is where we sort of are with the public and the science on climate change. The other thing that you all probably know is that there is denial about the existence of climate change, and, but even more so denial about its anthropogenic <coughs> causes. And I'm going to actually show you how that denial has evolved over time because it is getting better. An increasing number of people uh, are believing that climate change is happening. Now at about 70% of the U.S. believe that, that climate change is real. Um, but fewer believe that it is caused by human activity. Um, so this graph, I said I was going to be showing you things from the project and climate change. One of their graphs. They have some really great interactive data. If you go there, you can go on the state, you can go into the county and the congressional district and see it broken down all the way to county. Um, but this is the percentage of adults who think that global warming is caused mostly by human activities. This was 2014. So if they are yellow, they are above 50% of the people. If it's blue, light blue, it's below 50%. The darker, the fewer. This is 2014. This is 2016. Getting better. And they just, last week, put out the data for 2018. Much better, right? We are now at around 55 to 57 percent. Still not great, um, but over half of Americans now believe 
that global warming is mostly caused by human activities. You can see we have some states who are holdouts, um, but there are far fewer of them. This is good news. This is really good news. So there is still denial, though, and the question is why? And in order to better communicate about climate change, it's really important to understand the psychology of why, why we have denial. Um, and the issue is that psychologically, on an individual level, climate change is actually the perfect storm for denial because we tend to think short term, like immediate survival, like how am I going to get food on the table, or how am I going to get through my classes today, or how am I going to get through uh, teaching my classes today. Um, we tend to set, assess catastrophes, even very, very rare ones, as far riskier than long-term, slow-moving problems. And climate change, except for the occasional hurricane that hits us here, is generally a long-term, slow-moving process. And good evidence for this, um, people tend to be significantly more afraid of flying in an airplane than they are of driving their car. Flying in one of those. <laughs> than they are of driving in their car, even though you are significantly more likely, even if you're a frequent flyer, to die in a car crash than you are in an airplane crash. But it's a bigger, scarier catastrophe. You're falling out of the sky, there's fire, um, than, than a car crash, or at least it seems to be. The other thing is that for a car, you believe you have agency, right? You're driving the car, you have individual agency. You're probably not flying the plane. Maybe you are, but most people are not. Um, and we also tend to be very, tribal and very social. And this is one of the reasons why we have such a uh, political divide on climate change. It's become, it's, because it's become political, we have moved into and started to associate with our tribes. Um, and in some cases, we value tribal conformity over almost anything else. Um, so this all combined, maybe you've noticed, humans are pretty resistant to change. Um, this makes climate change the perfect storm, right? We will take, it will take huge changes to deal with climate change. It's long term, it's relatively slow moving, um, and we now have tribes of thinking about how it works. So this makes the denial relatively easy. And there actually are two major forms of denial. Um, one is called active and the other is called passive denial. Active denial is generally what you think of when you think of, for instance, um, a certain prominent politician who says that it's not real uh, or that it's not caused by humans. It is someone who is working hard to get you to not believe in climate change. Uh, someone who actively fought and fight to say there is no such thing. Passive denial is, I kind of think, more insidious. I think it's actually a harder form, which is, uh, one that a lot of Americans are in and that many of us might even be in some of the time, which is you know it's real, you believe in it, um, but you're just living your day-to-day -day life anyway without making any changes. Um, and this is the harder one to get past, to break through. Um, it's knowing it's there, but just not doing anything about it. So in order to preserve the beliefs already have, most of us, many of us, um, employ certain psychological tools. And one of them is confirmation bias. Uh, and one of my favorite ways to explain confirmation bias, which is um, seeking out information that confirms what you already believe, is when you're having an argument with somebody and do the thing that everybody does now when you're having an argument, you go to Google to decide who's right. And you Google whatever your question is, right? Okay. And the first two hits that come up disagree with you. But the third one agrees with you. Which one do you click? The third one, right? Because that's the one that agrees with what you said, unless you are a better person than I am. Um, so you click on the one that confirms what you already believe. And this is confirmation bias. You're seeking out information to confirm what you already believe. So if you already think that climate change isn't real, you're going to go on the internet or wherever and look for information that confirms what you believe. And the other is, like I said before, tribalism is our, um, our inherent uh, de desire to be part of a group and be part of our tribe. And tribes can be familial, they can be religious, and they can be ideological, so political. Um, and it comes from a, a desire to not be ostracized. 
And studies actually show that in many cases, people actually value loyalty to their tribe over the truth. It's more important to be loyal to your tribe than to actually have the truth. Um, and this pretty easily explains a lot of what goes on with climate change denial. So when we talk about tribalism, you obviously have to talk about the fact that it's become so political. Um, so this graph is showing a, um, an index um, uh, that was created um, compiling survey data um, from many, many different sites and many, many different sources um, from 2001 through 2013. And what you can see here is these two blue lines represent uh, Democrats and um, liberals. And these two red and pink lines represent Republicans and conservatives. And then this is everyone compiled here in the middle. And it's a little tough to see here, but this gap is widening. So it was a little bit closer together in 2001. If you look all the way out here at 2013, you can see that it's definitely farther apart. And anybody who studies the political divide on, on climate change uh, opinion sees this same, um, this same type of wedge, the wedge graph. Uh, but if you take it way back to the 90s, there is no divide. Um, the parties were in the same place. Uh, there's really good uh, video footage of George H.W. Bush talking about uh, wanting to deal with climate change. Um, so it's become more politicized over time as we become more tribal and, and more in tune with our political parties. And as the political parties have, frankly, actually divided on lots of different topics, not just climate change. Okay, so the next question here is, we know what people understand or don't understand. We have some idea about the psychology of climate change opinion and climate change understanding. The next thing I want to go through is, do we, do we talk about climate change? Do people talk about climate change? Because this is what we want to make happen, right? So this uh, graph is the percentage of, or this map, I guess, is the percentage of adults who think that global warming is happening. This is the updated 2018 data. Um, so you can see we're really doing pretty well here. This is about 70% of people believe that global warming is happening. This is the graph I showed you earlier. So this is the percentage of adults who think global warming is mostly caused by human activities. How many people, what percentage of adults do you think uh, say they talk about climate change at least occasionally? Not a lot. <laughs> it's at about 33 to 35%. Percentage of adults who discuss global warming at least occasionally. So this many people know that climate change is happening, and this many people talk about it. It's a big gap. This is the thing that needs to change the most, in my opinion. OK, so how do we make it happen? Who should we be talking to? Um, how do we make those people care? Because that's sort of an important part here. And then what's the most important thing for us to be communicating to people? Um, because you don't always have a lot of time, right? You don't have time to sit people down and give them a whole lecture on climate change science, nor would you probably want to. Um, so one thing to keep in mind is that those graphs and, and especially that graph of the, the partisan divide make you believe that there are only two groups of people in America. There are two cultures uh, when it comes to climate change. And that's not actually true. Um, it's sort of an oversimplification. And we have a tendency to actually overestimate the percentage of people who will disagree with us. So the Yale program actually found that there are six Americas, not two, when it comes to climate change opinion. And the six Americas range from the alarmed to the dismissive. So the alarmed are people who are already very, very convinced and already taking action. And the dismissive at the end are people People who are actively engaged on the issue, but on the other side, so actively lobbying uh, to say that climate change is not real. But there's a huge range of people in between. People who are convinced but aren't taking action. People who believe it's happening, but maybe it's not a threat. They don't really need to worry about it. Um, people who haven't thought about it at all. Um, and the doubtful are those who think it's not happening or it's probably not their fault, but that they're not out they're actively lobbying. Uh, and then you have the dismissive. Um, the dismissive only makes up 10% of the population. That's a manageable amount. When you put together 
the alarmed, the concerned, the cautious, and the disengaged, that's eight, almost 80% of the population that you could probably have a really productive conversation with. You don't even really need to talk to the alarmed probably, but, um, but you could have a pretty productive conversation with eight out of the 10 people around you in a well-mixed room. Um, not all rooms are well mixed. Uh, so, but this is, this should be hopeful anyway, that there are this many people you could have these conversations with. Um, also wanted to point out the people who are disengaged, um, they're also the most likely to say that they would be able to change their minds. They just haven't thought about it. Um, so they would say, oh yeah, if I had a real conversation about it, I might, I might care. Okay, so let's get ready to talk about climate change. What I want you to do is think of a person who you would like to talk about climate change. Um, it can be anyone, um, but the strategies and the goals we use will be different depending on who that the audience is. Um, I, for one, tend to have a, unintentionally tend to have many conversations with Uber and Lyft drivers about <laughs> climate change. They generally ask me what I do, and then I tell them, and then they, uh, and I just say I'm, uh, I teach environmental studies, and they immediately like, oh, let's talk about global warming. Okay, let's do that. Um, I don't do that all day, and I'm not tired of it. Uh, so think of somebody. And again, if it's your Uber or Lyft driver, you probably don't know them very well, so that will change how you approach it. If it's your crazy Uncle Joe, and I can say crazy Uncle Joe because my name's Joe, um, then you probably know a lot of things about them, and that could actually help you with your conversation. And the other thing you need to do when you're going to have a conversation about climate change is set a goal. Um, what are you trying to, to do with this conversation? And it's really important, um, mostly for you, because one thing that we tend to do when we start these conversations is put pressure on ourselves to get everything right and to, to win, to win an argument or win a conversation. And that actually does not have to be it at all. The point of your conversation could just be to have it. Um, it could just be to feel heard and for the other person to walk away not thinking that you're a crazy tree hugger. Um, that could be all. That could be all you want out of it. And just having that goal can make it just easier to set up the conversation and not feel that pressure. All right, so we have our person in mind. Let's talk about what doesn't work. Um, generally, depending on your audience, but generally, complicated scientific information, uh, statistics, numbers, jargon for the average person is not the most helpful way to uh, approach climate change. I'm going to throw my husband under the bus. Um, He's an engineer. He was my first climate change convert. Um, numbers worked for him. <laughs> He's an engineer. Uh, they don't work in anybody else that I've met yet. Um, but they worked for him. Um, another thing that does not work very well is very, very sad and emotional pleas. Uh, and the reason is because we all have what um, we refer to as a finite pool of worry. There are only so many things that we can worry about in any given day before we become emotionally numb. If you're going through your day worrying about um, what you're teaching in class that day or what you're taking in class that day and whether or not your paper is done on time and what you're going to make for dinner, um, when the SPCA commercial comes on with Sarah McLaughlin, <laughs> you turn it off because you're like, I can't even with this right now. Uh, and that is you being emotionally numb. You've hit your finite pool of worry. Um, and so very, very sad emotional pleas and often apocalyptic pleas, the end of the world is coming, um, those tend to actually backfire or just shut people down. Um, talking about things that are going to happen very far away and very far into the future, at least to start your conversation, are not particularly helpful, so no polar bears, um, because people care much more about things that are happening soon and close to home. And then finally, yelling, getting really angry, fighting with people. Um, I always like to say, when was the last time they got into a screaming argument with somebody and then walked away and were like, they had some really good points. Yeah, <laughs> and it changed my mind. It doesn't happen. You get much more entrenched in what you already believed and just think the other person's a jerk. Um, so yelling and fighting are not going to help. If something is escalating, if a conversation about climate change is escalating, it's actually just time to shut it down. Okay, so there, I have, I know that you're supposed to have three steps for everything, but I can't take it down further than four. Um, so I have my four easy steps for communicating about climate change. Know your audience, get their attention, 
address their understanding some of the time, and empower them to act. And that last one is super important. So for knowing your audience, um, it's really helpful to understand what is important to the person you're talking to, what's important to them in their life. Um, because this can help you uh, talk about climate change in a way that matters to them. Now, obviously, that's harder to do if it's your Lyft driver. Um, but if it's a family member, that might be quite easy. And you might be able to get some information in an easy conversation with somebody you've just met um, that can get you somewhere on this. Another thing you can do is try to gauge which America they are. So remember that six Americas spectrum. In your conversation, you can try to figure out where they fall on that. If you are talking to someone who is all the way in that 10%, that dismissive 10%, you're not going to get anywhere. There's no point. They are not going to change their mind. And you're just going to frustrate yourself and waste energy trying to fight with that person. Just remember they're only 10% and find somebody else. If they're anywhere else in the spectrum, go for it. And then what do they know? If you can figure out where they fall in terms of their knowledge, this can also be really helpful because you can address, directly address misunderstandings that they might have, like confusion between the hole in the ozone layer and global warming. All right, so you know your audience. Now you need to get their attention. You're going to use that information to get their attention. And um, the best way to do that, at least in our current understanding, is something called framing. Um, so framing is just finding that angle that makes it most salient to them. Um, in Florida, that's not particularly difficult because Florida is under so many threats from climate change. It was much more difficult for me in central Pennsylvania to set the issue as close to home and now and near term. I ended up finding a really great graph that showed how many days of the year we were going to start to have that were over 95 degrees um, that really worked well for people in Pennsylvania, but it took me a while to get there. Florida is a little bit easier. So setting it close to home now, what, what effects can we see right now? Uh, what effects are we going to continue to um, soon in the future. I'm on time. Okay? Okay. Um, focus on an issue that resonates with that person's interest. So if you know that they are religious, for instance, talking about stewardship of the earth can be a really great way to talk about environmental issues and climate change with someone who is very religious. Um, knowing other things about their hobbies or their subgroups or their affiliations. Um, here in Florida, talking about fishing can often be a really helpful way of talking about climate change. Um, hunting and skiing worked a little bit better further north, uh, although there, I'm sure there is some hunting in Florida. Um, the impact that it could have on the economy is, uh, for some audiences, is actually very, very helpful. Um, impact that, we, that it could have on healthcare. Uh, like higher uh, rates of asthma or higher incidences of asthma, um, spread of uh, infectious diseases. Uh, and then again, like I said, stewardship of the earth for religion. Um, the only thing about framing is one has to be careful not to zone in so far. So just be looking at skiing, for instance, that we lose sight of the bigger picture because skiing is not the tragedy here. Um, but it can be a way to sort of hook people and get them interested in something that they just really haven't thought about before. And then the other thing I like to tell people to do is to start your conversations with a grain of truth. A grain of truth is a really great way to get somebody to feel like you're listening to them. So if you start to have a conversation about climate change and they say, um, you know, I just have so many other things to worry about right now. There's so many other things going on in the country. I just can't care about climate change right now. And what you have to do is find something in what they say that you can repeat back to them as true. Um, even though you may want to yell at them, climate change is the most important thing, uh, uh, that's not going to help. So what you can say is, you know what, you're right. There are so many things to worry about right now. What are you most concerned with? And by doing that, you are repeating back what they said. You're making them feel heard like you believe in them. And you're going to get some information out of them about something that matters to them. So if they say they're really concerned about the economy, you now have an in because you can connect climate change and the economy, right? Um, so any more information you can get about who they are and what they're concerned with um, can help you make connections back to climate change. All right, so now we're on step three, which is address their understanding, which you also have to do without making somebody feel stupid. Um, and this is the tricky one because if you figured out that they are pretty curious about climate change but don't know very much, bringing in the science is awesome. 
Um, if you are talking to somebody who's super dismissive, the science doesn't matter. Um, they've probably even heard the science and seen it themselves already, and they, they've found their own science to counter it, and they just don't believe in it. Uh, but if you're talking to someone who's curious or confused, uh, or even um, who just hasn't ever really thought about it before, climate change science can be great. But you have to keep it simple. You have to avoid jargon. You have to address, uh, directly address misconceptions. So if you figure out, for instance, they're confusing climate change and other environmental issues, you need to hit those head on. And metaphors are really effective. So I told you my metaphor for weather and climate. Um, I have a couple of others that I really like. Um, one of my metaphors is about hurricanes. Um, so people often ask, can I say that Irma happened because of climate change, for instance? And I say, with hurricanes, you can't say any one hurricane happened because of climate change. It's sort of like, and my, my favorite metaphor has to do with baseball and steroids. If a player hits a home run, one home run in one game, you can't say that that home run was because that player hit steroids. Hit steroids. It's because that player <laughs> takes steroids. Um, but if they hit multiple home runs in every game, you might be able to start thinking that this player is taking steroids. So the hurricanes, uh, if you have one big hurricane, you can never say that one hurricane happened because of climate change. The pattern, the trend of increasing numbers and increasing intensity, that you can say could be because of climate change. Um, so metaphors like that are great. The other uh, weather climate metaphor that I really like um, is if somebody says, for instance, it is cold right now because of the polar vortex, where is climate change? Um, you can say that that's like taking a ruler and putting it on the ground and saying, look, the earth is flat. You're zoomed in too far. Okay? You need to zoom out. One day does not determine climate as a whole. Um, those types of metaphors can be really effective. And in some cases, depending who you're talking to, you might need to avoid buzzwords. Um, so for instance, greenhouse gases, climate change, global warming, those are all buzzwords, especially if the person comes from a, an ideological tribe that doesn't tend to believe in climate change. So you may need to say things like heat trapping glass heat trapping gases um, or a thickening of the blanket of gases in our atmosphere. Um, you may have to even just call it, even though it's scientifically incorrect, air pollution rather than global warming um, because air pollution is something people can get on board with. So you just sort of have to balance the correct science with trying to get people to think about the topic in general without shutting you down and dismissing you. All right, we're on to my last of my four steps, and this is empowering people to act. Um, and one of the best things about empowering people to act, or the best ways to empower people to act, is not to make them feel too guilty, um, because guilt is another thing that shuts us down. So you need to emphasize uh, actions that people can take. Um, people are more likely to feel concerned about something if they actually feel like they can do something about it. Um, so emphasizing effective action. You can explain personal actions they can take. Um, I do caution you though because generally changing your light bulbs in your house is not the most effective thing you can do um, by itself but it does help people feel like they can do something as long as you're warning them against single action bias um, making sure they aren't just recycling uh, and thinking they're off the hook um, the other thing that you can do is harness the power of social norms so we generally are more likely to do something if we think lots of other people are doing it too so how many of you have been to a hotel that had one of those little signs, placards in the bathroom that says, um, if you hang up, you know, help save the environment, uh, reuse your towels? Yeah? OK. If that sign says 70% of our guests reuse their towels, you are significantly more likely to reuse your towel. And that's social norms. It's because that is the established norm, and you, therefore you want to do it too. Um, so we're well, likely to act if others do. Um, and then also, this one is key, reminding people to take political and social action. This is about more than changing your light bulbs in your house. You're not going to fix global warming by, by going to CFLs. Um, it's great to do, but that won't do it. And for me, the biggest, the biggest item, the biggest action I is encouraging them to keep having these conversations, to talk to other people. Because if we're not talking about climate change, we're not bringing together social movements towards climate change. Without these social movements, we're not going to have the political action we need. We have to be having that conversation. Final pointers. 
Um, again, don't pressure yourself to get it all correct. You don't have to win. It doesn't have to be a fight, and you don't have to win. Along those lines, know when to exit gracefully. If people are yelling and there's, there are other people in the background watching, it's to go. It's time to make this stop because it's not going anywhere good. Um, don't forget to use the grains of truth that I talked about. Remember starting your conversations with something that they say and repeating it back to them so they feel heard. And my parting words here are that climate change absolutely cannot be a taboo subject anymore and that talking about it is actually one of the most effective actions that we can take as individuals. Thank you. Well, we have plenty of time because we started on time, which we usually don't. <laughs> Joe stayed on time, which most of our speakers don't. So, congratulations. <laughs> Thank you. Nice. So, we have, so we have plenty of time for questions. Please. Yes. If you could convince 90% of the people mm -hmm. that there's a problem, and, and then we're the cause.